Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, hockey fans. It is a temperate 9 degrees Celsius, 49 degrees Fahrenheit in overcast Bridgewater, Nova Scotia today. My name is Justin, Bridgewater's finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, and welcome to the Thursday, April 14th edition of the Bridgewater's Finest 2016 NHL Playoffs podcast. You're going to notice that this episode is up a little bit later than the last couple ones have been. I've just come off vacation, so unfortunately I had to work today, do those adult grown-up things, since the podcast isn't supporting me yet, but we're getting close. So this is up a little bit later than I would have liked it to be. In the future, I'm going to try to get it up. Even if I got to wake up six o'clock in the morning and record, then, well, that's just going to be what I'm going to have to do because I want to get it up and available to you guys earlier in the day than this typically. Holy cow, what a trio of games we were treated to last night. In Tampa Bay, the Lightning took on Detroit in Game 1 of their series. Tampa Bay wins that game 3-2. to two. Shots in that game 36-34 Detroit. It's kind of interesting. The three teams that lost their games last night were the three teams that had the most shots. And in one case, the last game we're going to talk about today, the shots were double. But shots in this game 36-34 Detroit. This was a slow start. I watched the entire first period of this one and then popped over to Pittsburgh and New York. But it was a slow start in this game. Once the physicality kind of kicked in, we're talking about the first five, six minutes of the game. Once the physicality kicked in, Tampa Bay really felt like the better team for the majority of that first period. They get rewarded at 623. Tampa Bay goal, uh, Kucherov from Johnson and Kalorn. Nice little one-time feed from Johnson there and Kucherov buries it. A little bit of a floater, but you know, it goes in. So Tampa Bay goes up one nothing. They take that lead into the second period. The Wings came out real strong in the second. They were just peppering Ben Bishop with shots and they get rewarded with back-to-back goals within the first five minutes of that second period. Two minutes and 11 seconds, Detroit gets on the board. Green from DeKaiser and Tatar. A bit of a point shot there from DeKaiser. Green just kind of gets the tip and it ends up in the back of the net. Four minutes and seven seconds, so just two minutes later, Detroit gets on the board again and takes the lead. Justin Abdelkader, who was an absolute wasp in this game for the Red Wings. Abdelkader, again, tips the point shot from Kyle Quincy, so Quincy gets the assist on there. All of a sudden, Detroit's got themselves a 2-1 lead. They've got all the momentum. Tampa Bay's got to do something. They, Tampa Bay just kind of stuck with their game. They didn't get, they didn't let themselves get confused or irritated or they didn't let it get them out of their game. So about five minutes go by, five and a half minutes. Nikita Kucherov with his second of the game gets his own rebound, buries it in behind Jimmy Howard. Assists go to Coburn and Nesterov. We got ourselves a tie game. I'd like to take a second and just kind of talk about Jonathan Drouin because I had mentioned him in the show yesterday about like, well, what's he going to do for his first playoff game? I thought he was going to score. He didn't do that, but he was all over the ice, man. He had a few shots. He had a few hits. He definitely got under the Red Wing skin. And that's kind of an element to his game that was certainly missing in the junior ranks. But I think he's kind of knows now what it means to be in the NHL after not being there for a couple of months. So he was all over the ice. Drew and I thought had a fantastic game. Let's talk for a second about the 2-2 non-goal from Victor Hedman. Jonathan Drew and involved again. A uh, little dump off pass. It ended up on the stick of Victor Hedman and Hedman buried it behind Jimmy Howard, but it was called a no goal because Drew and was just millimeters offside and it was so close one of those coin flip calls and the nhl it's a good thing to me that the nhl has video review for instances like this because you don't want these all important goals at points even really really early in the series every goal is important in the playoffs so you want to make sure that you've made the right call so i'm glad that video review exists i just hope it doesn't end up being the nfl where everything is video, like every play virtually is video reviewed and it slows the game down to a crawl. We're obviously not at that point yet and football is a bit of a slower game anyway, which is fine, it kind of plays into it, but I just hope the NHL doesn't get ridiculous with the video review. But here, it did work out. Drew was offside, barely, coin flip call, but it was the right call. But Tampa Bay, man, they stuck with it. They stuck with it. They kept going. 8.52 of the third. Tampa Bay takes the lead for good. Killorn from Johnson and Kucherov. That is Kucherov's 
third point of the game. What a game for that kid. Kalorn with the tip off of the Johnson shot. Tampa Bay goes up 3-2. That is your final score. Tampa Bay wins game one. Kind of interesting. I said they'd win the game 2-1. to one. They ended up winning 3-2. to two. A couple more goals than I thought. But hey, this was an excellent game. What a great way to kick off the playoffs. Of note, the two teams combined for 18 minor, minor penalties. And on those 18 minor penalties, there were zero goals. No power play goals throughout this entire game. So the penalty killing teams definitely were were put to work, we'll say. Uh, I think it was nine total power plays for 18 minor. There was a lot of offsetting things, but uh, no power play goals at all. So the penalty killers did their job. Tampa Bay holds on. Tampa Bay beats Detroit. Let's go to Pittsburgh now where the Rangers came into town to take on the hometown Penguins in game one of that series. Pittsburgh wins this game 5-2. to two. I said they'd win 5-3, to three, very close score. I also said their fifth goal would be an empty netter, and it was. So I was, I kind of had my Nostradamus hat on, so we did pretty good predicting these games. 5-2 Pittsburgh, shots were 37-31 for the Rangers. So once again, the team that got outshot ultimately ended up winning the game. The story of this game was Jeff Zatkoff in net for the Pittsburgh Penguins. 35 saves in his playoff debut. He gets the quote-unquote surprise start over Marc-Andre Fleury, unless you were me, because I thought Zatkoff was going to start from the beginning. And I'm just going to take a second to talk about what I like to call the Twitter reporters. The people that kind of follow and pay attention to the few people who will go to the morning skate. And those people who went to the morning skate said, and they were quite correct to point out, Flurry at one point was in the home side net, and he was the first one to leave the ice. So that usually indicates that a guy is going to start the game. But what really indicates that a guy is going to start the game is official word from the coaching staff or the team, which we didn't have. The whole time they were like, look, Flurry's a game time decision. It was clear it was going to be Flurry and Zatkoff. And then everybody on Twitter was like, well, Flurry was doing this and it was him and Zatkoff. So that means Flurry has to start. And I was like, don't assume that. You can't assume who's going to start and who's not going to start until the team actually says something. And lo and behold, like I said, how can you possibly be day to day with a concussion? Flurry was not ready to go. Jeff Zatkoff gets his first career playoff start. And what a story he was. 43 minutes of shutout hockey in this game on 25 plus shots. I think he had 27 or 28 shots before he allowed that first goal. What a playoff debut for Jeff Zatkoff. Goaltending was definitely the story in this game on both sides. For the New York side, not really what you want to see. Henrik Lundqvist gets high-sticked by his own player. I believe it was Mark Stahl. And he ended up leaving the game at the end of the first period. My question is, what's the point of having a goalie mask if you have a hole in it big enough for a stick to get through and high stick your goaltender in the eye? Like, what's the point? Somebody messed up designing these masks. If that is the case, that's definitely going to be looked at in the offseason, I'm sure, since it happened to a star player. Antiranta comes in to the goal for the Rangers. I don't think any Rangers fan was expecting to see Antiranta in the first game of these playoffs. Usually means bad news. And unfortunately, it meant bad news here. In the last minute of the first period, only 18 seconds to go in the period, Pittsburgh gets on the board. Patrick Hornquist crash in the net, assists to Shiri and Latang. Hornquist pops it in behind Lundqvist, who was still in net. He did try to gut it out. He left at the end of the period. Hornquist gets Pittsburgh on the board, one nothing. Almost a full period goes by. Pretty back and forth hockey, to be perfectly honest. I thought this was a pretty good game. Pittsburgh gets on the board again, doubling their lead. Sidney Crosby, Sid the Kid. Patrick Hornquist with a beautiful stretch pass right across to him. Crosby on the breakaway. The last thing in the world that you want to see, especially if you're anti-Ranta. Boom, zings it by him. It's in the net. It's 2 nothing. Hornquist at this point definitely having himself a game with a goal and a helper. There was more to come. In between the second and the third period, Coach Alain Vigneault saying Lundqvist was day-to-day with an eye injury. And if you saw him after this happened, you could tell like he was going to be out for a little while. Now where they're saying it's not anything too serious, but at the same time, they won't commit on his availability for Game 2. The smart money says Anti-Ranta probably starts Game 2 as well. 
We kick off the third period and Pittsburgh takes the ever rare two penalties on the same play play in the early third. So they go from five on five to killing a five on three penal power play, including a four minute minor, a double minor for high sticking that drew blood. So it was just, it was just a bad sequence of events for the Penguins and they happen pretty well. Boom, boom, right one after the other, the Rangers connect on the power play. Derek Stepan, who had himself a game, Nash and Broussard, the assist, beautiful little tic-tac-toe play. Stepan puts it in behind Zatkoff and it's 2-1. We got ourselves a hockey game. Until about two minutes later, because Pittsburgh, if you didn't know, were one of the most aggressive penalty-killing teams in the league this year, and that pays off a short-handed goal for the Penguins, 531 of the third period. Kunakel, and I had to look twice, maybe even three times to write his name properly, Kunakel on the shorthanded two-on-one with Nick Benino. You would expect Nick Benino to be the one to take that shot. He's had a pretty good season stepping up and playing in place of Evgeny Malkin since he went down with injury. But he dishes it off to Kunakel. Bang. It's 3-1 Pittsburgh. How are you going to give up a shorthanded two-on-one in the playoffs? Shorthanded two-on-one? That means you had four players back. Like, come on, I get it. I get it. It's the power play. You're trying to tie the game. You still had like two and a half minutes on a power play. I understand that. But how are you going to give up a shorthanded two-on-one to a guy not named Crosby? Like, good Lord, just awful. I mean, the Rangers deserve to have that one go in the net, quite frankly. And then two and a half minutes later, it happens again. But this time, Pittsburgh on the power play. 8.02 of the third period. Patrick Hornquist again puts it in. Actually, Crosby put the puck off of Kessel's backside. And Hornquist, doing what he did best, apparently, crashing the net, gets the rebound. Boom, it's in the net. It's 3-1 Pittsburgh. Sorry, it's 4-1 Pittsburgh at that point. Jeez, I'm, I'm losing track of my goals. 4-1 Pittsburgh on Hornquist's second of the game. The Rangers getting in a little bit of desperation mode here. Two minutes later, they do get another one. It's Derek Stepan again. Like I said, he had himself a game. 10-11 of the third period. Stepan from Boyle and Zuccarello. Stepan picking up the rebound there. Dan Boyle's rebound and pockets it. It is now 4-2. The Rangers are still in this thing. It's only a two-goal deficit. You got half of the period left. Pittsburgh just played a really good end of this game. A good end of the game to keep themselves in the lead it was kind of keeping the rangers at arm's length the rangers had their chances obviously but i mean jeff zadkoff again zadkoff was just really fantastic in this game pittsburgh ices it with an empty netter 17 10 of the third it's hornquist again hornquist gets himself the hat trick assists go to crosby and daly so just awesome there hornquist with a playoff hat trick and that's the game i mean pittsburgh holds on they win at 5-2 this was a pretty rough game there's some bad blood I think that's brewing over here I mean having played now and I think what did we say it was the third straight playoff that these two teams have played so there's some bad blood there for sure these two teams I think it's going to be a tight series moving forward as I said I would expect you to see anti Ranta in net for game two I think they're better off leaving Lundqvist let him get a little bit of rest. Let him make sure that there's 100% nothing wrong with that eye. Bring him back for home ice in game three. I would expect to see Ranta in game two. Pittsburgh, though, wins game one, five to two. Then we move on to what was absolutely, positively, definitely the game of the night. Chicago traveling to St. Louis to take on the Blues. Game one of their series. St. Louis wins this game one nothing in overtime and ladies and gentlemen for the third straight game i get fairly close here i told you this game was going to go to overtime the wrong team won in terms of my prediction pre-game i thought chicago was going to win 3-2 but i said let's get greedy take it to overtime and in fact they did chicago outshoots st louis in this game 35 to 17 brian elliott with a 35-save shutout in the first game of the playoffs. Talk about a confidence builder. And this is why this is the series to watch. I told you, before this series started, this was going to be the series to watch in the Western Conference. That game one is exactly why Chicago had so many chances. They dominated the first 20 minutes of this game. They outshot St. Louis in the first period 11-4, 
and forced the Blues to take three penalties. So they had three power play opportunities, could not convert on any of them to get anything behind Brian Elliott. The Blues, to their credit, kind of tried to answer the fact that they weren't getting a volume of shots. They weren't getting nearly enough chances on Corey Crawford. They tried to answer that by controlling the physical game. And they actually did very well in that. They doubled up the Blackhawks in hits in this game. I believe it was 41-19 to at the end of the third period before it goes into overtime. So they were they were really doing a great job of being the more physical team doing what they needed to do with a Chicago team that was de- depleted, especially on defense, given that Duncan Keith was not playing in this game, serving the last game of his suspension. Blackhawks take a bad penalty at the end of the second period. Really bad, dumb penalty that you can't take in the playoffs. Machinter with a really bad tripping penalty. They survive that. Chicago turns it on again in the third period. Shots in the third period were 8-2 to two for Chicago. They were desperately trying to end this thing in regulation. Brian Elliott shined in net for St. Louis. Was definitely the right choice to start him. He would not allow anything. We go into overtime. The Blues take a bad penalty at the beginning of overtime. Keep themselves focused. Kill it off. And at 9 minutes and 4 seconds of the first overtime period, David Backus tips in the Jay Bomeister shot. The other assist goes to Alex Petrangelo. And just like that, St. Louis, on home ice, takes game 1, 1-0 in overtime. This was a great game. I mean, this was such an awesome game, and this is going to be such a fun and fantastic series to watch moving forward. I'm super excited to see what they've got in store for Game 2. Okay, so before we get into talking about the games that we've got on slate for tonight, we've got four of them tonight. The friggin' NHL did it to me again. For the second podcast in a row, they broke important news while I was recording the podcast. So I'm literally just going to have to sit here with like Bob McKenzie's Twitter account open just to see what they're going to do while I'm actually trying to record my show. The Toronto Maple Leafs, during yesterday's recording, re-signed both Nazem Kadri and Morgan Riley to six-year deals. Kadri's got an AAV of $4.5 million. Riley's is a little higher at $5 million. I think this is an excellent deal for Morgan Riley. I think it's a lesser deal for Nazem Kadri, but it's still a worthwhile deal just in terms of the term. They're buying up multiple years of both of these guys availability as an unrestricted free agent and i mean that costs money uh the riley deal again aav of five million dollars i think in two three years morgan riley's really going to be worth that five million dollars like he's he's pretty close to being worth it now i would say like if you signed him based on his talents right now i'd say he's probably a 3.5 million dollar a year player but in a couple of years that's going to be a fantastic deal and they'll still have a couple of years to go on it morgan riley i think is going to be A really, really, really excellent defenseman in this league. Nazem Kadri, I'm up and down on Nazem Kadri. What I think the Kadri deal means is it's likely that Toronto's going to be trading or getting rid of Tyler Bozak. I figure he'll probably be maybe a draft casualty or free agency or something like that. Uh, I would expect Tyler Bozak is going to be uh, out the door. I wonder, though, and I'll ask you guys this question, too. Does this hamper in any way Toronto's ability to pursue Steven Stamkos? Because everybody's talking about, like, oh, Stamkos is probably going to go to free agency, and if he does, he'd want to go play for his hometown Maple Leafs. Well, now they've just tied up $9.5 million a year for the next six years. So is that going to hamper their ability to pay Steven Stamkos the kind of money that Steven Stamkos is going to demand? on the unrestricted free agency market because i mean this is going to be a player that's probably going to be worth in the double digit million dollars per year and i don't know whether the leafs are going to be able to afford that maybe there's a hometown discount in there uh i shouldn't make it sound like i don't like nazim kadri by the way i do um i'm not 100 percent sure he's a four and a half million dollar player i think that four and a half million dollars is more reflective of the marketplace as a whole for top six centers. I figure that's probably where that money comes from. I would have been more comfortable signing Kadri at three and a half, maybe four. But I mean, again, buying up those years of unrestricted free agency, that costs money. So, I mean, I understand where it comes from. In any case, I think these are both good deals for the Maple Leafs. 
It's a sign that they are further committed to their future in this rebuild, signing two of their younger players, two of their top players. I think they're good deals all around, but in a couple of years, that Morgan Riley deal is just going to be, it's just going to be unbelievable. In other news around the league, the Boston Bruins have brought back Claude Julien. This is a surprise to me. Um, They've brought him back. He's going to be behind the bench to start the 2016-2017 season. We'll have to see sort of how that season goes before we make any kind of judgment on his long-term future there. But honestly, I just, I think it was a surprise, especially like you look at his demeanor behind the bench in that 6-1 loss to Ottawa, which killed their playoff chances. And he just looks like he doesn't want to be there. And he looks like the players look like they don't want to be there and they don't want him there. So it, it it seemed like all the writing was on the wall for Julianne to be shown the door. But it turns out they're going to be bringing him back. I mean, look, Claude Julianne is a good coach. Like, Julianne is a good coach. I just kind of felt like maybe it was... Time for a change there. Time for a change of scenery for Julien. There are going to be a lot of coaching opportunities for somebody like Claude Julien. There are going to be some openings. So, who knows? I mean, it'll be interesting to see, though, the coaching casualties after the first round of the playoffs. Some teams that expect to go deeper. If they don't go deeper, I mean, you could see some changes come there as well. All right, let's tee up tonight's games. They start in just a couple of hours. We're going to start with the first game tonight, the Philadelphia Flyers traveling to Washington to take on the Capitals. That's game one of that series, so obviously 0-0 tie. This game begins at 7 p.m. Eastern. It's available on CBC in Canada as well as NBCSN in the United States. Your likely goaltending matchup is going to be Steve Mason for the Flyers taking on Braden Holtby for Washington. My question, and I got actually a couple of questions that I want to ask you guys in the scope of this game as well as in this series. You look at Alex Ovechkin, and a lot of the rhetoric around Ovechkin right now is like he's been in the league. This is his tenth year or eleventh year. No, I think it's tenth. Yeah, oh five, oh six. I think it's. I think it is his tenth year. Where does Ovechkin rank on the list of best players who have never won a Stanley Cup? Because, I mean, people are heralding him after a decade as, you know, arguably the greatest goal scorer in N- or one of the greatest goal scorers in NHL history. Certainly the greatest goal scorer of the modern era. But where does he rank in terms of, because there's a lot of really great players that have never won a Stanley Cup. You look at how long it took Ray Bork to win a Stanley Cup and, and you know, other, other players as well. But where does Ovechkin rank on that list of players best players who have never won a Stanley Cup. I know there's a lot of lists of it online. Take a look at that list. Tell me where you guys think Ovechkin ranks. I think he ranks pretty damn highly, but where does he rank in terms of best players who have never won a cup? This is one of those series that I'm actually really worried about because I went pretty heavy with Washington on my playoff pool. And honestly, I mean, look, I'm giving Philly a chance here to win a couple of games. I don't know whether I'm going to give him a chance to win the series, but I'm giving him a chance to certainly win a couple of games. And in the process of doing that, I think there's a real sneaky fantasy sleeper here. I mean, obviously your 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 pools are done, so this is kind of a moot point, but it's a guy who I think is going to do some damage in this series, and that's Wayne Simmons. Every time I see Wayne Simmons play, he shows me a new facet to his game. He shows me something that he's never shown me before. He's turning into, very quickly, one of my favorite players in the league. Wayne Simmons, I think, is a sneaky sleeper in this series. Could make a huge impact tonight and could make a huge impact moving forward. And sticking with the flyer side of the ice, the ghost bear, Shane Gostis bear, has been one of, if not the biggest story for the Flyers this year. That was, of course, before the passing of Ed Snyder. But how do you think the Ghost Bear is going to fare in his playoff debut? I mean, this guy is is so good. Like, this guy is two, three years down the road. This guy's going to be money. Like, he's just such a good player. He's so complete and came so sort of out of nowhere here. But how do you think he's going to fare in his first ever playoff game? As far as a prediction for tonight's game, I like Washington to get off to a hot start on home ice. I'm going to take Washington to beat Philly 3-1 tonight on home ice in game one. Take a 1-0 lead. Washington wins 3-1.
Let's go back down to Florida where the hometown Panthers are going to be welcoming the New York Islanders for game one of their series. That game begins at 8 p.m. Eastern time. That game is available on Sportsnet as well as CNBC in the United States. Your likely goaltending matchup is going to be Thomas Grice between the pipes for the Islanders taking on Roberto Luongo for Florida. Thomas Grice in because Yaroslav Halak is going to be out for a little while, maybe out for the playoffs. It's a bit of a dicey situation there between the pipes for the Islanders. Thomas Grice gets the start tonight. And that's my first question. And that's going to be the first thing that I'm going to be paying attention to in this game. This is an awfully big stage. And these are some awfully bright lights for Thomas Grice. And I'm just wondering if the stage might be a little too big and the lights might be a little too bright. I think Thomas Grice is a fine goaltender. This is going to be easily, I would say, the biggest game of Thomas Grice's career, starting game one of a playoff series, which I don't believe he's ever done before. Uh, And he's against, he looks down at the other end of the ice, and he sees a guy like Roberto Luongo, who has had playoff success and had international success, and is is a winner, and has had a great season. So uh, it's all very intimidating for a guy like Thomas Grice. I got to wonder too, and I got to ask myself, I know Yarmer Yager has talked about like, oh, I'd like to play until I'm 50. And, uh, you know, and he seems like he's still going strong and going as well as he's ever played. But I got to ask if this is maybe not Yager's last shot at the cup, but I wonder if this is his last best shot at the cup. This Florida team looks pretty good. Although I do also have to question, you know, how far can this Panthers team go in the playoffs are they underrated? Are they a little overrated for winning the division? Like it, it's there's all kinds of questions I feel around this Panthers lineup, including a ton of playoff inexperience. But could this be his last best shot at winning the cup? Because he's playing as well as he's played in a long time, and he casts an awfully big shadow. They've got a susceptible opponent here in the Islanders who have had their own playoff struggles, and uh, this time of year has been. Uh, not overly kind to this franchise. They've got John Tavares, but they've got injury concerns and they may be ripe for the picking here, but you got to wonder like this might be Yager's best shot to get back to an Eastern Conference final, a cup final, winning the cup. I wonder if they win the cup this year. I mean, geez, maybe he retires. Maybe he's like, well, I mean, that's it. Why not go out on top? So that's an interesting thought too. I don't know. Maybe it happens. Maybe it doesn't. We don't really know. As far as a prediction for game one tonight, I like the Panthers on home ice, but I think this game's going to be tight. Thomas Grice, I would have to imagine, would be watching Jeff Zatkoff last night to be like, okay, let's take a look at another guy who started his first playoff game. Oh, geez, he did pretty well. I think this is going to be a tight game, close game. I like Florida 2-1 to beat the Islanders in game one to take a 1-0 lead in the series. Panthers win 2-1. Let's move to the Lone Star State now as Minnesota travels to Dallas to take on the Stars in Game 1 of their series. This game gets underway at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. It's available on Sportsnet 360 in Canada as well as NBCSN in the United States. Your likely goaltending matchup, we're not 100% sure. I don't think a starter has been named for Dallas at this point. Although, I'm going to do what I did the other day and I'm going to get on Twitter and I'm going to see if the Stars have named their starting goaltender yet. We know, obviously, who's going to be going for Minnesota. It's going to be Devin Dubnik. But as far as who's going to be between the pipes for Dallas, we're not 100% sure yet. One thing, unfortunately, we are sure about now is that Tyler Sagan will not be playing for Dallas tonight. Originally, we thought he was cleared. Looks like now he has not been cleared. He will not be available for the game tonight. Zach Parise obviously will not be available for the Wild as well, being reported today that he may require season-ending surgery, which would be very unfortunate for Parise. (laughs) Ha ha, I got you this time. They tried to break it 10 minutes ago. I wasn't going to let them on Twitter. Kari Lettinen will be in net tonight for the Dallas Stars. It looks like that's broken. So Lettinen was probably going to be my lean anyway, but it looks like Kari Lettinen will play for the Stars tonight in goal. Even so, Devin Dubnik, I think most people would say, probably gives the Wild the goaltending edge in this series. That is the edge, the way that I went with it when I previewed the series on episode one, I believe it was. So it's likely that he has the goaltending edge. 
But this Dallas offense, man, this offense is so good. Even without Sega, this offense is so good. They get production from absolutely every position, except, of course, the goaltender. But, I mean, they get offense from virtually everywhere on the ice. Is this Stars offense too powerful for somebody like Devin Dubnik? I've talked before about how I thought Dubnik was a little bit overrated and 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 such, but it's possible. I mean, could the Stars be a little too powerful even for a good goaltender who probably is going into game one knowing he's got the goaltending edge in this series? Maybe that Stars offense just a little too much. If you're looking for somebody on Dallas's side of the ice to really pick up from the fact that Sagan is not going to be playing, look no further than Jason Spezza. Spezza could very well be the Stars MVP, not only in this series, but moving forward. This guy is a proven playoff performer. This time of year, this guy loves the bright lights. He really picks his game up in the playoffs. Jason Spezza... I grabbed him very sneakily. I grabbed him in my playoff pool because I think he is going to have a dynamite playoff this year. So keep your eyes out for Spezza, one of the only 30-30 men in the league. As far as our prediction goes for tonight's game, I like Dallas. I think this is going to be close. I think it's going to be an offensive game. I have very little faith in Kerry Lettinen, to be perfectly honest, in the playoffs. He's a good regular season goaltender. Not a great playoff goaltender, to be honest. And that Stars offense, again, even without Sagan, this is a good offense anyway. you slice it. I like Dallas to win this game 4-3. to three. I think we're going to have lots of scoring in this one. And let's get greedy. Let's say it's going to go to overtime. Dallas beats Minnesota 4-3 in overtime in Game 1. And your fourth and final game tonight takes us to California. A matchup of Californian teams, the San Jose Sharks, taking the short trip to Los Angeles to take on the Kings. This series, of course, tied at zero. It's Game 1. The game gets underway at 10.30 p.m. Eastern, available on CBC in Canada, as well as CNBC in the United States. Your likely goaltending matchup is Martin Jones for the Sharks. The Sharks have given Game 1 to Jones, but they're going to be deciding their goaltending on a game-by-game basis that's already been announced, which makes me pull at my collar a little bit. But in any case, we got Martin Jones taking on Jonathan Quick. This is, of course, Jones' first playoff start. The Sharks' goaltending, as I mentioned, it's a cause for concern to me, just because... You have no playoff experience in Martin Jones making his first ever playoff start. You have very little playoff experience in James Reimer. And you look at the other side of the ice and you have Jonathan Quick. And here's a guy that's won a pair of Stanley Cups, I believe. And all kinds of playoff experience. And is one of those players that just takes his game to another level in the playoffs. And it's kind of like in the New York Islanders and Florida series, there's an intimidation factor there if you're the opposing goaltender. Now, you either take that as a challenge and it makes you up your game, or you let that crumble you. And it's kind of interesting, it'll be interesting to me anyways, to see which Martin Jones shows up in this series, because he has been susceptible this year. On the plus side, the Sharks will be getting defenseman Mark Edward Vlasic and forward Matt Nieto back for this game for Game 1, which is good for them because I think it's got to be about more than just the top-end scoring for the Sharks. The Sharks have all kinds of scoring. We're looking at Thornton. We're looking at Pavelski. They've got guys that can score, but they need depth. San Jose, if they want any chance in this series... I think San Jose has got to run four lines and they've got to run them consistently. And that's got to be exactly what they want to do because that's what Los Angeles is going to do. They're going to be able to run four lines because that's how they play playoff hockey. They play four line games. They play defense first and San Jose has got to be pressure, pressure, pressure. They've got to rely on their depth and it's got to be constant pressure on Jonathan Quick if the Sharks want to have any chance in this series. We've also talked for the last couple of years about how the Sharks window is kind of closing here. And I think that is more a reflection of Joe Thornton's personal window than it is for the Sharks as a whole. It seems to me that they're a team that's kind of getting a little bit younger. But at the same time, like as Thornton goes, the series goes for the Sharks, maybe that window's closed. I don't know. This could be their last shot. And I think... They're thinking about that. I think that's in the back of their minds that, geez, this could be our last shot. Who knows? We better make it a good one. And then, of course, they draw the Kings in the first round. I think this is going to be a fun series to watch. I think tonight's game is going to be fun as well. 
I like the Kings, though, on home ice. I like the Kings by a score of 3-1. to one. Maybe that third goal is an empty netter. I would expect this to be a fairly close game. Jones is going to have to play the game of his life. I think he plays well, but I like the Kings. I'm going to take the Kings to win the game 3-1. to one. All right, folks, that's going to do it for today's episode of the Bridgewater's Finest 2016 NHL Playoffs podcast. I want to take a second to thank everyone who's taken the time to watch the previous episodes to this one and who takes the time to listen and watch this episode. I want to thank everybody that got into my NHL.com playoff bracket challenge and uh, hopefully your pools are all doing very well. Hopefully a bunch of you drafted Patrick Hornfist and Sidney Crosby and Derek Stepan and, and, and you had a party last night because you had a great start to these playoffs. I hope you enjoyed last night's games. I hope you enjoy the games tonight. We got four really good games on tap. I'm Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, and I'll see you tomorrow.